Today we have a, a great speaker. Um, we have Mr. James Barrett. He's running for North Carolina State Superintendent of Public Instruction. So we have someone that is going to introduce him before he comes up. So let's give her a hand as she comes. Thank you and good morning. Um, this is a special interest to me because James is a relative of mine by marriage. Uh, his brother is my son-in-law. So I'll tell you a little bit about James. He's a child of North Carolina public schools under our education governor, Jim Hunt, and he's a child of the teacher. So he says he's been listening to teachers all his life. <laughs> he's a lifelong Democrat who has campaigned door to door for the past two decades for pro-education candidates, and he decided to run for office himself eight years ago, and he won the election to the Chapel Hill Harborough School Board. He ran after volunteering for seven years as the founding education community member of Justice United, a local interfaith social justice advocacy organization. Now, in his day job, James has spent his career managing large change efforts as a software engineer, first for IBM and now for Lenovo. His wife and children are also products of our public schools. Their son is a junior at UNC, and their daughter will graduate this year from high school. So I uh, offer to you James Barrett, a relative. Hello, Rowan County. How are y'all? My name is James Barrett. I'm running for superintendent of public instruction. Rowan County is a, is a really special place to me because I realize it, it's probably the county in North Carolina that has the most number of people who love people that I love. We'll say it that way. <laughs> my, uh, my, my, my brother's in-laws, uh, Bob and Linda Volker are here, um, and also my son's girlfriend's parents, um, wow. Carol and Jake uh, Parrott are here. And uh, I really uh, appreciate um, all of them being here. Um, it's a, I actually came here for, for Easter because, uh, not to campaign, but uh, um, to, to, to enjoy time with the parents. So, um, it's a, Rowan is a, is a special place to me. Um, I also want to say, by the way, um, your speaker next month, Scott Huffman, of, of all, so I've been traveling the state, right, campaigning for a statewide office. It's a big state. And there is no congressional candidate out of the 13 races that we have in the state of North Carolina that I have seen more places than Scott Huffman. So he is, he is doing the work. He'll tell you how many miles he put on his car next, next month, I'm sure, because uh, he's always got it at the top of his head. But um, it is, uh, um, it, it's important work. It's, it's important that we're competitive everywhere, right? Um, and, and as a statewide candidate, uh, I really appreciate that we have energy um, amongst the Democrats everywhere across the state. Because you know, even though um, I'm sure your state senate races, um, you will, you, you guys will both, um, you know, be really strong and, and try to run that. It's a, it's an uphill battle, right? It's an uphill battle. Um, it's in many of these rural counties, and it is. Uh, um, but it is important because um, every vote that you all turn out for Democrats and get excited matters. I mean, you know, we may not, uh, we may. We may not change the presidency here in North Carolina, but we have a real chance of changing the Senate. We, we may or may not, right? But we have a real shot at making a difference in the Senate, okay? The U.S. Senate, we have a very flippable seat. Tom Tillis is, um, you know, really betrayed um, everybody uh, with the things that he's done. Um, we really, really need to reelect Roy Cooper, right? Roy Cooper is... Uh, brought tremendous leadership to that position, um, and, and particularly around education, I'll get to that in a second, uh, why that's, that's really important. Um, and then there's a whole council of state. We don't know who all the Democratic candidates are gonna be, but you know, the Lieutenant Governor, well, I'm not sure the Lieutenant Governor matters that much, but um, you know, <laughs> the Insurance Commissioner matters, right? We, we, we pay lower insurance rates. We used to have the lowest insurance rates um, on our car insurance of anybody when we had Wayne Goodwin as insurance commissioner before. And we need to get back to that. We need Jessica Holmes to protect working families um, as a labor commissioner, right? We need an ag commissioner who, who actually cares about small farmers and not the big corporate interests, um, who is actually acknowledges that climate change is real, right? I mean, farmers know that climate change is uh, affecting everything that they do. 
And so uh, we need to change our ag commissioner as well. Up and down the ballot, right? And then um, I'm sure you guys have local races, county commissioners, school board, um, all those things, all those things matter. And so um, I, as, as, uh, as Linda said, um, I have done a lot of campaigning for other candidates across the state because I do believe that public education, right, my work at Chapel Hill Carborough um, is made better when we have people in Raleigh um, that are truly pro-public education supporters. So I've gone and knocked on doors in Alamance County and Pitt County and Wake County, um, you know, uh, I'm not sure exactly, you know, down in Charlotte, uh, we, we've been all around um, previous election cycles, not just, not just now because I'm running for this office, but because I do believe in supporting pro-public education candidates everywhere. And I, my commitment is, um, and I'm the only person in this race for state superintendent who's made this commitment, is that I will be back in every one of the 170 districts across the state of North Carolina, 120 House districts, 50 Senate districts. I will come back because we need to have a public education conversation with each and every General Assembly member and hold them accountable for the actual votes, not just the rhetoric, right? You guys are not too far from Union County. You know that, that Craig Horn makes a lot of noise about supporting public education um, and, and how he tries to do things. But if you actually look at the votes, right, the budget votes in particular, they have decimated public education in this state. Um, and that's not just me saying that. Uh, we actually have the evidence now. Um, you guys probably have heard, heard of the court case Leandro, right? The, the, Leandro was a, um, was a student, um, he's actually now an adult, actually, interestingly enough, a lawyer who has, uh, who has worked on his own case, um, worked on Leandro case, but Leandro, 26 years ago, was a student in Halifax County that wasn't being well served by public education in North Carolina. 26 years ago, well, a little less than that, but um, certainly decades ago, the Supreme Court of North Carolina said, you're right, we are not meeting, North Carolina has a great constitution, by the way. Um, you know, the, the, the U.S. Constitution, we all learn in school and, and really revere, well, maybe our president doesn't, but most of us revere, is, um, you know, is a great document, but it doesn't mention education. The North Carolina Constitution, though, specific, is very explicit. It says education is a foundation for our society, right? It's not just an economic driver, which it is, and it's really, really critically important for um, the economic future of our state, but it also is what creates an educated society, you know, is what actually creates people who know how to vote. Um, you know, we have a Board of Education, our Board of Elections member here, right? Encouraging people to go vote. We also want them to vote educatedly, right? We want them to be educated so they know what's important and they know how to ask the right questions um, and be engaged in the civic process before they go vote. And so we, we know that public, and the other thing that the Constitution says is, is that every student across the entire state of North Carolina, each and every student, not just some students, each and every student is entitled to uh, what the courts have now interpreted as a sound basic education. The Constitution actually says an equal opportunity will, provide, will, will be provided for every student. So the Constitution is really clear. We need an equal opportunity for a sound basic education in each and every classroom. What's amazing with what, this moment in time, um, which by the way was enabled by the leadership of Governor Cooper, he brought together the state board, he represented the state of North Carolina, he also brought the plaintiffs together, and he said, let's agree with what this actually means. What does it mean to get a sound basic education um, across the state of North Carolina? We're gonna get a third party to come in, do the evaluation, um, and give it to the court and say, we all agree, this is what it takes, and the court can sign off on it or not, and then figure out how to make it happen. And they did that. They just released that report um, a little over a month ago, and that report says, um, Yes, we are not meeting our constitutional obligation today. It actually says that, you know, over the course of the Andrew case for, for, for more than two decades now, we've taken steps forward, right? Under Governor Hunt, we actually added the pre-K program, the North Carolina pre-K program. And that was a great step forward. But in the last nine years in particular, we've taken steps back. And the, and the report and the, the, the court is now saying this, that our cuts to public education are not acceptable. They don't meet the constitutional obligation to, and there's seven, there's seven key bullets there. I'm sorry, I don't have all of them memorized. But you know, the first one is um, adequate funding. 
and the General Assembly clearly has that responsibility to provide adequate funding. But then after that, there's also a bunch of other things, right? We need a quality teacher, a high quality teacher in each and every single classroom, right? And, that, and there's, there are policy things that the state superintendent can do, that the State Board of Education can do, that actually don't, I mean, pay is part of that, right? I'm not gonna say it's, um, it's not part of what the General Assembly could do. But there's also things for restoring respect for our teachers that we need our state um, policy makers outside the General Assembly, not going to ask for permission. Uh, we need to, and I have the experience, I've been on the Chapel Hill Carborough School Board for eight years. I know how to make policy that actually respects our teachers. It makes things like, make sure they know they have a First Amendment right to speak up, right? The, the, the right of free speech in the First Amendment is not the only right in the First Amendment. There's also the right to petition our government. There's also the right to free assembly. Um, and making sure that teachers know they can exercise those rights, not in front of students, that's not the, that's not the right place for it, but understand that they, they are the experts about what's going on in our classroom, and we value their input um, in that process. That's part of uh, providing respect for our teachers that we can do with policy without asking the General Assembly for permission. And so I have the experience of making policy choices like that, um, being creative in how we do our policy work, um, and, and we'll do that, bring that to the state so we can do that work there as well. Um, there's also work with um, particularly teachers of color uh, that we need to make sure that we're focused on because we know that students of color benefit um, tremendously by having teachers that look like them in their classrooms, right? There is proven you know, data that shows there's greater achievement um, just by having, that's a value uh, that, we, that we need to make sure is represented in our schools. And so, um, we in Chapel Hill, for example, we started focusing on this, and in one year we increased the number of African American teachers that we recruited, brought in that year by 50%. Um, it is possible to do, um, and it is work that, that I have experience in, and again, we'll bring to the state level to make sure that we're being creative in how we recruit teachers um, and, and, and encouraging um, more diversity in our, in our teacher ranks. The second big bullet on the Leandro report is a high quality principal in every school. And you know, you may think principals are, you know, they're getting paid a lot of money, they must have a, a cushy job. Well, um, you know, they are uh, CEOs of their school, right? Every single problem that, that crosses that business um, is the principal's responsibility. They have to deal with parents, right? Parents are the, well, parents are the worst, right? Um, <laughs> They have to deal with teachers, they have to deal with kids, they have to deal with the plumbing, right? They have to deal with the roof that's leaking. Uh, they have to deal with, with everything. Um, and, and if they are not high quality, our high quality teachers won't stay, right? The number one thing that causes just employees overall, human beings, whether they be teachers or, well, I guess teachers are actually superhuman, but um, you know, all human beings like to work for somebody that they feel respected um, and is a great leader. And, and so we need those great leaders in each and every um, building uh, in, our, in our schools. We actually, in Chapel Hill Carborough, uh, a couple of years ago, had a superintendent opening. And I was uh, fortunate to be the chair of the school board while that process was going on. And so did a lot of work to recruit a great superintendent to, um, to, to go through an intensive uh, interview process. And we ended up hiring someone who understands that her main mission as a superintendent is to serve those building leaders um, and to provide whatever supports they need so they can be successful, right? The, the, the leaders at schools, you know, are not, are not the people who are actually doing anything, right? Um, the superintendent, you know, I'll say this, you know, as a person running for state superintendent, right? What I do on a day-to-day -day basis doesn't really matter. It's what the teachers do on a day-to-day -day basis that matters. And, but to get the teachers to do what we need them to do on a day-to-day -day matter, we need building leaders that matter. We need superintendents that matter. And then we need a state superintendent who understands their job is not to tell the teachers what to do all day, but their job is to support and provide the resources that our teachers need. Um, and so that level of leadership and understanding that is the way we actually get things done through other people um, is what I bring to the job. And, and Linda mentioned I've been with Lenovo and IBM for the last many decades. Um, but I, uh, you know, that's what I do. I, I bring change to large systems. Um, I lead large, high-performing teams, um, really on a global basis. Um, I understand how I get work done remotely, you know, not having to, I mean, 
yes, walking around and having having relationships and face to face is, is wonderful. And I will continue to travel the state as your state superintendent. Um, but I also understand how to have influence and have relationships uh, remotely as well. Um, and to be able to um, have connections um, and get work done um, through through that manner. So. Um, those are, the, those are the first three bullets of the thing. The fourth is uh, making sure we have enough support staff. Mm -hmm. And I was talking to someone earlier uh, as, we were, as everybody was gathering um, about the needs that our students walk in with. Um, and they are great, they are greater than they ever were, right? The effects of poverty, the effects of uh, trauma that the students go through at home, um, the social emotional needs of students are greater than they ever were before. And we do not have the support staff um, across the state of North Carolina. We do not have the psychologists, the counselors, the social workers, um, the nurses available. Uh, we're not even funding our, our school lunch program um, and breakfast programs well enough. That, um, and and that's, that's great news. Um, there's also some, the other last couple of recommendations are a little more technical and in the weeds, but, um, but I'll just leave you with that the, you know, about the 42 detailed recommendations um, in this report and about a third of those you know are actually funding and things we need our General Assembly to do two-thirds of the work that we need to do to get our schools back to where they're delivering a co our constitutional obligation to each and every one of our students are things that we need the leadership in the state superintendent's office to do whether it's things that the the DPI, the Department of Public Instruction, can actually deliver to districts around the state through support services, um, which are being gutted under the current uh, superintendent, um, providing actual support to districts. That needs to be reinvigorated um, through the right leadership and the right choices and priorities of the superintendent, or whether it be policy things that the, the technically the State Board of Education has responsibility for policy, but the state superintendent influences that by proposing policy changes um, and making those suggestions to the state board. So um, I have the experience in both the, the leadership capability um, as well as the policy work that's needed to bring those changes about to restore our schools, right? We were, if you guys don't know, in the, um, you know, right around the, the turn of the millennium, um, as Governor Hunt was finishing his second set of terms, we were actually recognized as the best system, best state in the entire country. Right, in, in measurement of growth of our students, um, in measurement of our, our science scores, for example, um, if we had been measured as a separate country, we would have been like number five in the entire world, not just in the, in the state or in the country, but also around the world. North Carolina public schools were truly doing great things a, a generation ago. And we can get back there. We have the capability um, of, of really making sure that we deliver on our constitutional promise, we have, you know, we have places where, where there are good things happening today, um, and we need to build on those, and we need to share those ideas um, across the state, um, and then we need to make sure we've got the right people in place and the right support structures in place, um, the places that are having more challenges. Um, I am, by the way, um, I, I will say tentatively in support of um, what's going on here in Rowan County um, from, a, you know, from a, a um, the renewal school district, right? I believe in local control, being on a school board. As a local school board, you obviously understand the importance of local control. And there's a lot of things with like cal calendar flexibility that are no brainers that we ought to have across the state. Um, there's some things that, you know, I, I, I don't want to go too far in terms of the charter model that the renewal school district can do. But, um, you know, I, I do believe in innovation. I believe in trying new things. Um, and I think we ought to take the lessons learned out of the work that Roanne's doing um, and figure out where we can apply those around the state um, and take the best ideas that come out of that, the things that get the best results, um, make sure we're implementing those around the state. Um, and, and so I am I'm supportive of, you know, of, of have, continuing the conversation. Um, I do believe we, we actually realize that relationships matter between students and teachers. Um, you know, students don't learn until they know um, that the teacher actually cares. And, and we also, I think we need to model that at the adult level. We need to make sure that the adults are having the right relationships, uh, state superintendent to the General Assembly, state superintendent with the school board, our current, our current superintendent who is um, you know, a lame duck because he decided not to run for this office again, is still this week 
having fights with the state board of education. Um, he, he, you know, he's, he's nobody's listening to him because they know he's not going to be in that office for long. Um, but he still thinks that he's has an advantage by by picking fights, and, and that's not my style. Um, I, I do have a, an advocacy background, um, as, as Linda mentioned, and we. I will make sure that we have, and that's a that's a relationship model um, first. And I do believe strongly in having relationships uh, with our general assembly members, uh, with our state board members, with our local superintendents, uh, to understand what common issues we have, um, to make sure that we're actually, you know, having small wins and getting agreement on um, common good things that we all agree we ought to do for for students. Right, students um, is absolutely my first priority. Um, and I will have build those relationships at the state level amongst the adults um, and model that so that our teachers also know um, that they, the other thing is teachers are so mad about the current state superintendent um, and my commitment to them um, to all teachers and, and to all y'all is um, you don't need to worry about the state superintendent anymore right you shouldn't have to know who this person is right you should know that our schools are well taken care of without the drama that's going on now um, and and I will I will fight for for our schools every day um, and make sure that we're, we're seeing that improvement uh, without people having to worry about uh, um, about what's going on and the integrity of what's going on in that office as well so um, I think that's as we're going to ask you questions right um, my name is James Barrett. I'm running for, for superintendent of public instruction. Thank you.